This hearing will come to order. This is the uh, Subcommittee on International Trade, Customs, and Global Competitiveness of the United States Senate Committee on Finance. And we're grateful that everyone's here. Uh, we're sorry that we're a few minutes late. Um, I'm privileged to be joined by Senator Wyden from Oregon. He's the top Democrat, what they call in Washington the ranking member of the Committee on Finance. And we're late for a good reason. We just had a phone call that uh, both of us will talk a little bit about, but I wanted to make sure that uh, we first and foremost thank the Community College of Beaver County. Uh, Dr. Reber, we're grateful you're with us today and uh, grateful to have the benefit of the, the report that you gave me about the work, the tremendous work being done here on, on a whole range of workforce issues and preparing for the future of Beaver County and southwestern Pennsylvania. And uh, we don't have time to get too far into that today, but I think a lot of what we're talking about today on, on trade and especially infrastructure has, has relevance to those discussions about our workforce. So doctor, thank you for having us here and we're, we're grateful. I want to thank our witnesses that I'll be introducing in a moment uh, before um, we get into uh, our testimony. But we're here today to discuss what what I view, and I think most Americans view, are two of the most critical issues that relate to the competitiveness of our nation, manufacturing and infrastructure, which have, of course, a substantial impact on jobs and wages. I'm honored to be joined by Senator Wyden, who uh, came from Washington to be with us, but as you know, he represents the state of Oregon and has worked for years on all these issues, trade issues, uh, economic and jobs issues, manufacturing, uh, infrastructure, and the like. We know that steel overcapacity, as well as trade cheating, and China's efforts to literally steal our future by stealing our, our companies are some of the most fundamental trade challenges of our time because they directly impact Pennsylvania jobs and wages. I've said for years, and I'll say it again, when China cheats, Pennsylvania loses jobs. It's that simple. So we have to face that reality when we're confronting uh, these issues. China is China's going after Americans' competitive advantage by any means necessary. If China can't buy it or if China can't run it uh, out of business, they usually steal it. And unfortunately, that's a harsh reality. So you don't need to look far in our state to find companies and unions who have been hacked by the Chinese government. Just talk to U.S. Steel, talk to steel workers, uh, talk to other institutions in southwestern Pennsylvania who have been victims of these actions. I went to the White House this past Tuesday to meet with the President in a bipartisan, bicameral, both houses of Congress, senators and House members of both parties, including Senator Wyden, who was with us at that meeting, to discuss steel and aluminum principally but to talk more generally about a number of these issues. At that meeting, I told the President how Pennsylvania companies have been hammered, and I use that verb purposefully, hammered by a surge in imports since the Commerce Department announced its Section 232 investigation last April, which was focused on rising steel and aluminum imports uh, and how they represent a, a threat to our national security. I also heard from senators telling the president to exercise caution. That's what a number of Republican senators and House members were uh, telling him. Um, I have a different view, which we'll get into later. When the Commerce Department launched this investigation in April of last year, uh, I, along with steel workers across Pennsylvania, were hopeful that the Commerce Department would quickly complete their study and the president would take decisive action. And then we waited, and we waited, and we waited. Through the spring and the summer, rumors were swirling, but still, still uh, imports were surging. The Commerce Department seemed ready to transmit the report by the end of the summer, and then the President told the Wall Street Journal in July that he did not intend to move forward on a final determination on the section, steel section 232 case until, quote, everything finished up between health care and taxes and maybe even infrastructure, unquote. 
So said the president at that time. Meanwhile, we watched imports rise for the first 11 months of 2017. Total steel and finished steel imports were up 17.5% uh, and 14.6% respectively from the same period in 2016. So total steel basically up 18% imports up uh, and finished steel imports up basically 15% percent uh, in that time period. Imports of electrical steel, which many of you know is the steel used to um, ensure that we have an electricity grid, which is another infrastructure issue that we're going to be dealing with. Imports of that kind of steel, electrical steel, have more than doubled from 2016 to 2017. Pipe and tubes surged 82 percent from 16 to 17. So, so electrical steel up 100 and uh, pipe and tube up 82. Commerce Department had 270 days to transmit the report to the President. They submitted it just shy of that by a few days. The President now has 60 or 90 days. Actually, now it's 60 because it was almost a month ago. So basically 60 days to make a determination. Now, one of the, when you have these meetings, you don't have um, 25 minutes to make your point. You've got to make it in about two minutes. So my point was to raise the issue with the President on 202 because the discussion started to meander off into other issues, and I wanted to keep it focused on, on these issues. Um, I made two basic points to the President. One was that number on electrical steel, uh, to remind him about that, and two, to ask him to cons make a determination not using the whole 90 days. It, th I wanted him to bring a sense of urgency to this issue right now. And he listened and, and uh, uh, listened to our, our, our pleas, and I, and I hope we'll make a decision. So why were we a few minutes late? Well, Senator Wyden just got a call from Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross. Um, they, they, uh, they obviously talk on a regular basis, but uh, I thought it was particularly opportune that a hearing that was supposed to start at 9.45 and all of a sudden we got a call at 940 from the Commerce Secretary about this issue. Senator Wyden uh, can tell us more, but uh, apparently there's going to be a press conference or press call at 1030, right? which is good news. That means that um, somehow between the meeting the other day and today's hearing, we've gotten some people's attention. I'll leave it at that for now. Let me go back to China and then wrap up. I said earlier we can't allow China to steal our future, and it's that's not drama and hyperbole, that's the truth. If we allow them to continue the pathway they've been on, they will steal our future. Actions matter, and the actions we take today must be directed at long-term outcomes we want for our children and our grandchildren. This means an economy that creates opportunities for all Americans and a system that creates a fair environment for our workers to find jobs that pay family-sustaining wages. This also means investing in our roads and bridges, schools, locks and dams, which are so important to commerce here in southwestern Pennsylvania. And of course, our electricity grid, and I didn't mention broadband, and we could go down a longer list. You get it. Infrastructure matters. It's about our security, it's about our safety, and it's about our jobs. So this means putting real federal dollars behind infrastructure that is fundamental to our combined competitiveness. I am never opposed to public-private partnerships or other ideas to finance infrastructure, but we have to have significant federal dollars. I believe you can do infrastructure one of two ways. You can do the, the corporate way, which is not the way to do it, or you can do it the American way. I want an American infrastructure bill. It means we're all in this together. We're all one American family. We ought to put public dollars in and big dollars to really make a difference and create jobs. So this means making sure that the inputs to that infrastructure are made in America. Uh, I think both parties agree on that. And I'm grateful that Senator Wyden is here today to make these points and to discuss these critical matters for the economy of Pennsylvania and jobs in Pennsylvania, as well as American jobs, American competitiveness. So I'm happy to turn the microphone over to Senator Ron Wyden, the ranking member of the Committee on Finance, and I hope 
This is just my hope. I'm not allowed to say more than this. I hope a year from now we'll be the chairman of the most important committee in the United States Senate when it comes to our economy. Ron Wyden. Th thank you, Se Senator Casey. And I don't want to make this a bouquet tossing contest, but I want to note that Senator Casey's hearing could not be more timely. Sometimes in the Congress you hear about a hearing on such and such subject and everybody says, well, we'll come back in a couple of years and see if anything's going on. With respect to Senator Casey's hearing, we just heard from Secretary Ross indicating that here in maybe 20 minutes or so, the country is finally going to be told what are going to be the options. What are going to be the options to protect American jobs, protect American industries, and particularly in our case, and I heard Senator Casey talk about this at the White House, is try to make sure we actually use all the tools to keep foreign companies from making an end run around our trade laws. And what we've done over the years, and Senator Casey and I have been a team with, uh, with several colleagues, is we've put in place a variety of new tools to deal with how these countries rip us off with for example, dumping practices and subsidy practices and the like. But as Senator Casey noted at the White House, these tools haven't always been used. And to sum it up, what we want is trade done right. And that means using all the tools and using them in a timely way. Now, as Senator Casey mentioned, if you look at this past year, what you have to say is by some measures, steel workers are actually worse off than they were a year ago because there was a lot of tough talk early on that led to a surge in steel imports. And so a lot of struggling steel communities were wondering what was next. I think what we learned in this call this morning from the Secretary, from Secretary Ross, is as a result of this kind of effort and with Senators like Bob Casey weighing in as they have, this administration is finally realizing they better act sooner rather than later. That is how I would sum it up. And here in 20 minutes we will get uh, an inkling of what the major recommendations are with respect to both steel and aluminum. Of course, the president has legal authority to set all of them aside. He doesn't have to do any of them. But we will finally get this long overdue report that we wanted. In some sense, a number of us said at the White House that to make thoughtful recommendations about matters like the 232 law, You've got to have the report, and we've been pulling and prying and pushing to get it out, and now finally it's getting out. One last point, and then, uh, like Senator Casey, I want to hear from um, all of you. When I talk about using all the tools in the toolbox, you can't afford in a time like this to pass up opportunities. And I'll just close with a point with respect to infrastructure. We all understand that for big league economic growth, you can't have little league infrastructure. So when the infrastructure plan came out this week, I just kind of rushed through it to see what was going to be in it to talk about using more American steel and more American goods and services. There is essentially no there there, no mention of Buy America vital to American uh, steel. And by the way, the plan actually gives the states the ability to walk back current law with respect to using American steel and American products. So Senator Casey and I feel really strongly that in this battle to deal with global competition, we feel we can beat the pants off everybody as long as our government uses the tools that it has at its disposal.
So we're anxious to hear from all of you. Um, one of the few benefits of um, seniority is you can give all the difficult questions to Senator Casey and anything <laughs> easy to me. But it's nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Senator Casey. Senator Wyden, thanks very much. We're grateful you're here and uh, lots to talk about. Let me introduce our, our witnesses who have been in their seats for a good while yet. So I'm, I'll do brief introductions, but I don't want to skip over letting everyone know. As many of you know these witnesses already, either personally or by the way of their work. Scott Paul is president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing, which is a partnership established in 2007, I can't believe it's that long now, by some of America's leading manufacturers and the United Steelworkers Union. Scott currently serves as the board chair of the National Skills Coalition and is on the board of visitors of the political science department at Penn State, his alma mater. Scott also has an MA in uh, security studies from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Scott, welcome. I'll do all of our introductions and then we'll just go to the testimony after that. Um, Petra Mitchell, the, the, in the third chair obviously, uh, is president and CEO of Catalyst Connection, a private nonprofit economic development organization dedicated to helping manufacturers grow their businesses and create new jobs. She currently serves on the board of directors of the Advanced Robotics and Manufacturing Institute, uh, Leadership Pittsburgh, and Pennsylvania Industrial Resource Center Network, so-called IRC Network. Petra received numerous honors for her leadership, including being named one of the 2016 most admired CEOs in Pittsburgh by the Pittsburgh Business Times. And I've known Petra for years. Petra, thank you for being here with us. Uh, Rick Galliano is the president of the Beaver Lawrence County Central Labor Council and a representative for the United Steelworkers. Before his career in the Steelworkers Union, Rick worked at the TMK Ipsco Koppel Steel Facility. He's a graduate of Lawrence County Bow Tech School in Newcastle in Lawrence County. Rick sits on the Lawrence County United Way Board and is a member of the Lawrence County Drug and Alcohol Commission. He lives with his wife of 40 years, Mary Ann, in Newcastle. So Rick, thank you for being with us and thanks for all that work you do on a lot of issues. Todd Young serves as the Managing Director of Government Affairs for the United States Steel Corporation, reporting to the President and Chief Executive Officer David Burrett. Todd manages U.S. Steel's federal, state, and local government affairs. Todd, thank you. So Scott, why don't we start with you? And we'll try to keep, if you can, keep it to five minutes because we want to get to as many questions as possible. Certainly, Senator Casey. Thank you so much for uh, hosting this hearing in the Western Pennsylvania, um, which in many ways was America's foundry uh, for, yep. for so many generations. And Senator Wyden for, for venturing here as well. Uh, I want to commend uh, both of you for your leadership, your work on manufacturing, trade, infrastructure, issues, and I, I especially want to commend the role that you played just earlier this week at the White House. I thought that your, uh, your, the feedback that you delivered to the President, obviously it was heard. Uh, I know Senator Wyden said, let's see these reports, uh, and three days later we had it, and Senator Casey, you, you mentioned, uh, as, you, as you said in your opening statement, what the consequences of this delay have been, which are, which are very real. I mean, we've, in addition to the imports that we've seen increase, uh, uh, it, it's stunning that at a time where you, you see modestly positive economic growth uh, overall that the steel industry is struggling. That does not make any sense and, and you can only draw a correlation to the rise in imports uh, which you can, you, can, uh, you can clearly attribute it to companies and countries trying to game the system and, and get in before any relief is provided. So I'll, I'll be eagerly awaiting uh, the, uh, the recommendations of those reports uh, as well, but I want to commend both of you on your leadership. And I hate to refer people to Twitter a lot, but I thought, Senator Casey, you had some especially poignant thoughts after the, uh, after, after the meeting at the White House about what the impact of this has been for Pennsylvania uh, that, are, that are worth pointing out to, to the audience. Um, uh, I want to say that, uh, you know, trade has traditionally been a very bipartisan uh, issue um, uh, and that uh, impacts red states, blue states, uh, every state. Um, and uh, in that vein, I was uh, excited to serve on the President's Manufacturing Jobs Initiative. I had hoped at the beginning of it that there'd be a robust role on it for trade. Uh, that didn't occur. Uh, instead, uh, we, we weren't able to accomplish 
much anything. And, and I was also, I think, as I think a number of us from industrial states were, uh, hopeful based on some of the president's rhetoric uh, with respect to trade enforcement and very specific commitments that he made uh, that we would see a substantial amount of progress. Uh, the way I would characterize it to this point, of we've seen a lot of trains that have left the station, uh, but none of them have arrived and a couple of them have been derailed. And uh, it, we need to get them on, on track for America uh, and for American workers in particular. Um, uh, I, I have a lot of content in my written remarks, and I won't bother repeating that, uh, but I just wanted to, to, to focus on a couple of principles in the time that I have. A and that is that I think you, you both recognize this, but for too long, trade enforcement has been viewed as an appendage of our trade policy rather than a core of it. Uh, and that has had extraordinary consequences. Uh, we've seen uh, a rising trade deficit with China. It reached a record $375 billion in goods last year. Uh, you've seen countries that feel like they have a blank check to dump, to subsidize, to, uh, to, to uh, engage in market distorting practices, uh, intellectual property theft. Uh, and while you've seen enforcement in past administrations, uh, it's hard to make the argument that it was central to their st trade strategy. Oftentimes it was designed to deliver votes on something else. Or if in, uh, you know, in the case of Reagan, Congress wanted to do much stronger, take much stronger action than he did. Um, George Bush saw a political opportunity in West Virginia by offering some relief for, for steel, but you haven't seen it at the core of a, uh, at, the, at the core of an administration's trade policy. I think you understand that, and that's something that, that we encourage this administration to pursue um, as well. Uh, and I'm going to return to that uh, in a second because there certainly has been a, uh, a real disconnect and a real division in our country on, uh, you know, on economic lines, on what's happening with respect to manufacturing, uh, on the outlook for trade that I think has been colored by this fact uh, that it hasn't, that trade enforcement hasn't been a central part of, of America's economic uh, philosophy for a very long time. Uh, second, I, I want to expand upon this idea that uh, the, the President's promises and the lack of follow through so far have had some real consequences uh, because, because I think they, they have. You pointed out, Senator Casey, uh, with, the, with the 232 announcements, the rhetoric, and then the, the lack of follow through have, uh, have, have, have occurred so far. And you've seen in, you know, in Conshohocken um, some layoffs announced uh, in Steelton uh, at, at uh, Durabond. Uh, we've seen a, uh, a steel mill in Kentucky that has closed down. You've seen uh, challenges in the aluminum industry um, as well. Uh, to add to your data on uh, surging imports, uh, in oil country tubular goods, uh, which are a specific uh, high margin product for the steel industry, one that's very essential to the ener energy infrastructure, you've seen a 200% increase uh, in imports just from 2016 to 2017. Just yesterday, uh, at a major energy project in uh, Texas, um, the, uh, the, the, the Gulf Coast Express Pipeline Project, uh, the, the funders of that project announced that uh, more than half of the pipe would be coming from Turkey uh, as opposed to American producers. And we know that Turkish steel is often dumped and subsidized. And so this raises to me real questions about a, another commitment that the President made, and that was that we would have American-made pipelines. Um, uh, it's, uh, there was a memorandum signed with great fanfare a year ago at the White House, uh, and there's been no palpable follow through that I've, I've seen with respect uh, to that. Um, I also want to say that uh, I want to commend the, the role that both of you have played in trade enforcement uh, and the, the improvements that we've seen in the law in the last couple of years. Uh, they've had real tangible uh, and, and uh, helpful impacts that I'm happy to uh, expand upon uh, in Q&A if we should arrive at that, uh, but they've been uh, they've they've made a real difference uh, for uh, for American industry uh, and for um, for American workers. Um, uh, say a word about infrastructure, and then I'll I'll, I'll close with with a, with a thought uh, back on on trade expansion. So uh, all of the trade actions in the world won't make a difference if we don't have a a robust public investment. Uh, to, to increase demand in this country. We've fallen behind. Uh, it obviously has an impact for commuters. Uh, it has a, a serious impacts for manufacturing. Uh, with respect to logistics, uh, competitiveness when it comes to global trade, 
uh, and uh, attraction for attracting both talent uh, and, and, and moving materials uh, and people back and forth. And so, uh, and by infrastructure, I speak very broadly. I think like you do, that we need our, our everything from our broadband, our energy grid, to our, our bridges, our, our roads. We need a serious upgrade. I share b your belief that this has to be public investment. We're not opposed to public-private partnerships. We also see the strong benefits of uh, ensuring that it's uh, made with American-made iron and steel. That's how we've built the most magnificent achievements in our country, and there's really no reason to think why we can't do it now other than some vague philosophical objections and maybe perhaps some envy that, that other nations may have. Um, I want to I uh, uh, end on a very wonky note, but one that I think resonates today. Uh, and that, th that, that goes back to the underlying legislation of the Section 232, which no one, I think, had focused on a lot before the President said he was going to take this action. It was part of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962, which was perhaps the biggest legislative achievement um, of that Congress uh, pushed by President Kennedy. Uh, it's notable that at the signing ceremony uh, of that act, George Meany, the president of the AFL-CIO, was there supporting a bill that dramatically uh, uh, cut tariffs uh, on products, gave the president broad authority to do that. Uh, but in that, embedded in that legislation were a number of trade enforcement tools, including Section 232. The fact that over the years you've seen that trade expansion uh, and, and tariff authority take off, and you've seen free trade agreements, uh, where you've seen the the, the real uh, real sporadic enforcement of trade laws, like through uh, Section 232, speaks to kind of the situation we're in, where our politics have become more radicalized, uh, our communities have become less less hopeful. In a way, there's an eroded sense of trust in the government's ability to respond to problems and. Part of it is precisely because we have not exercised these trade enforcement tools. Um, I think that needs to be a central part of our trade agenda as we move forward. I want to commend the role that Senator Wyden, you have played uh, in the past, uh, and Senator Casey as well, uh, both with the Enforce Act and the Level the Playing Field Act, and look forward to working with you in the future on that. Thanks so much. For Scott, thanks so much yeah. for your testimony and for that perspective from history as well. Rick Galliano. Good morning. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the caucus, it's an honor for me to, for to speak with the, at this Phillips hearing on the trade enforcement inf infrastructure. My testimony to you is straightforward. I try to do everything in my power to improve the livelihood of our union brothers and sisters, our communities, and our country. I would like Congress and the administration to also do the same. My concern is the tools of our country has to defend its manufacturing base and move it further into, new, into the new era it needs to be improved, but much more must be done. Since Congress passed the leveling of the Playing Field Act and the Enforce Act, at a slew of trade enforcement cases followed. Our union sees the day-to-day -day results when a worker gets a job back and their hours are increased. I also see the potential if we, we have to do more, restoring fair play and ensuring that we have a fair chance to compete internationally is all we ask. For example, since USW successfully brought forward trade cases in the passenger vehicle and light truck tires from China and off-road tires from India, close to $3 billion have been invested into U.S. tire plant expansions and factories. 7,200 union workers at Goodyear reached a five-year agreement with wage improvements and extension of plant protection guarantees with where no USW plants will close during the term of the agreement. To the doubters of the value of trade enforcement, I dare them to them to look at those workers in the face and tell them they are not worth protecting. I wish I could say there is a similar positive outcome in the steel industry as the tire industry. Since the passenger of the leveling playing field, Act 67, New tariffs against multiple, multiple of countries have been put in the effort on steel. With these trade enforcement acts have slowed the tide of illegal imports, too many of the 19,000 steel workers have been laid off since 19, 2015 are still waiting for idled and unionized facilities against the country to restart. 
And let's remember, trade cases are simply about addressing unfair foreign trade as agreed upon international rules. We weren't asking for anything that the law wasn't designed to provide. The USW has cautiously, op been ca cautiously optimistic about the change for unilateral relief through implementation of Section 232 steel and aluminum investigations currently in President Trump's hands. When President Trump and the administration officials pledged to unveil the findings of the Section 232 investigations by July 1st of 2017, we were hopeful at first and left wandering the day after. The USW firmly believes that our nation, nation's military and critical infrastructural needs are as essential to our national security. By delaying the 232, the foreign steel industry saw an opening. While the U.S. has shipped more steel this year, finished steel import market share was 27 for the full, 27 percent for the full year of 2017. Total and finished steel imports are up 15.4 percent and 12.2 percent, respectively. The economy has grown, but the U.S. steel, but U.S. steel industry continues to fight for on because of foreign steel products. Most of the growth in our market is going to imports not to our steel mills and our steel workers. Our trade laws need to reflect more globally connected world and the potential for abuse of bad actors. A modern steel workers in this country can make 1.9 steel tons of steel per year per man. I want our country's trade laws to be more efficient and, and effective. You asked me to speak in on infrastructure and no amount of trade enforcement will matter if we cannot get our goods from coast to coast. The Finance Committee has a potential not to just upgrade our trade laws, but also seek the path and renew the, our na nation's infrastructure. It is simple, if I paid half my mortgage payments, I would lose my home. Yet this country are only paying half of Americans' infrastructure bill, leaving the investment gap to strike the gridlock traffic. Please think about this. 88 million citizens in urban and rural America left affordable and broadband access. One, of the five, one out of five miles of highway pavement is in poor condition. I do not know all the solutions to these problems, but just like every USW member, I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and fix these problems. We need to ensure that our tax dollars are used to minimize the e economic benefit and domestic policies to buy America. In closing, I know that the, I know that with a strong trade enforcement strategy combined with a concerted effort to renew our infrastructure, we can create a better America. Thank you for your time. Hey Rick, thanks very much. And I was noting that one number you had there on page, I guess it's page four. A modern steel worker can make 1.9 tons of steel per man hour. That's a good yeah. number to remember. Petra Mitchell. Good morning. Good morning. And Senator Casey, Senator Wyden, welcome to uh, southwestern Pennsylvania. And uh, thank you for having me here today. This morning I'd like to address our nation's supply chain, which is made up of small and medium-sized manufacturers that serve many sectors, uh, but including our infrastructure, metals, advanced materials, DOD, and our national security sectors. At Catalyst Connection, we are dedicated to serving these companies. We provide technical assistance, management consulting, and workforce development such when individual companies grow and succeed, collectively they impact the region's economy and our nation's supply chains. To enable us to do our work, we are funded in part by the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, or MEP program, and the Industrial Resource Center program here in Pennsylvania, which was started by Governor Robert Casey, Senator Casey's father, and was a model for the national program. So I feel this was very, very insightful on Governor Casey's part uh, to start this program. I'd like to provide you with a brief overview of the MEP program and then some of the challenges that our small and medium-sized manufacturers are facing and the role that the MEP program and Catalyst Connection are playing in helping to address those challenges. And Senator Wyden, I liked your term using the tools in the toolbox. I'd like to suggest that MEP is a critical tool in that Absolutely. toolbox. The MEP program is the only federal program dedicated 
to serving our country's small manufacturers. And these companies make up 99% of all manufacturing establishments. Last year, we served 26,000 companies across the United States. Many of these firms are often overlooked by larger for-profit firms because the cost of sales can be high and the typical project size is low. The impact of the work, however, is very high. The MEP program delivers $8.70 for every dollar of federal funding invested. This is according to the Upjohn Institute. MEP clients themselves reported over 12 billion of new and retained sales and the creation or retention of over 100,000 jobs just in the last year. Considering that the average manufacturing worker earns over $80,000, MEP centers are economic drivers in their communities. Fortunately, the MEP program has been reauthorized by Congress through the American Innovation and Competitiveness Act. Unfortunately, the President's budget once again eliminates the program. Catalyst Connection clients have contributed to the national program results just mentioned. Companies that work with us are hiring, growing, and adding jobs. But we need to do more. Sadly, manufacturing <coughs> employment in our region has decreased by almost 5% in the last five years, even though output and productivity is growing. We believe that a majority of the job losses are from larger firms or plant closures of some larger firms, but the growth in jobs among small and medium-sized manufacturers is just not enough to make up for those losses. To reverse these trends, companies must accelerate their pace of growth, greater than any productivity gains they need to remain competitive in a global economy. They have to invest in new products, automation and robotics, and in their people. And this is a big challenge. And while many companies are growing and interested in hiring, the skills gap in manufacturing is another significant challenge. And according to a Deloitte report, the skills gap may result in 2 million manufacturing jobs going unfilled. Manufacturing CEOs are looking for help, and the MEP program can provide it. Our services and operational improvements business growth and innovation, exporting, and training create the foundation for the adoption of new and advanced manufacturing technologies and for upskilling of workers. So I would urge you to continue your support for policies that favor small businesses and for the MEP program to continue to support small and medium-sized manufacturers that provide high-paying, family-sustaining jobs. And I'd just like to share that I am personally the beneficiary of one of those jobs where my father worked in manufacturing and even as an immigrant was able to provide me with a very comfortable childhood and a college education. I would like to see many more of our friends and neighbors have similar experiences. And I feel that with your support, that is definitely achievable. Thank you. Petra, thanks very much. Todd Young, thank you. Thank you, Senator, for conducting today's hearing in Western Pennsylvania and for inviting testimony from the United States Steel Corporation, which is proudly headquartered here in Pittsburgh. Uh, Senator Casey, your leadership in convening the hearing is very much appreciated because both trade law enforcement and improving America's infrastructure are public policy priorities for America's steelmakers. U.S. Steel was founded in 1901 and is the largest integrated steel producer headquartered in the U.S with domestic annual raw steel making capability of 17 million net tons. Our major domestic steel operations are located in Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, and right here in Pennsylvania at our Mon Valley Works. Our tubular operations are located in Alabama, Ohio, Arkansas, and Texas. And our two Minnesota mining operations supply iron ore pellets to all of our steel making operations. U.S. Steel Corporation manufactures semi-finished steel, as well as a wide range of value-added flat roll and tubular products for the automotive, appliance, container, industrial machinery, construction, and oil and gas industries. When it comes to trade enforcement, over the past several years, America's steel companies and workers have been challenged by significant, persistent, unfairly traded imports flooding our markets from overseas. 
Steel at dumped prices and subsidized by foreign governments targets are America's open markets. As a result, many American steelmaking facilities, including those of U.S. Steel, have been forced to shut down temporarily or even permanently, causing thousands of job losses. American steel companies can compete and win against anyone on a level playing field. Yet that requires fair enforcement of our trade laws and strong, prompt action by the federal government. We commend Congress on passing the 2015 Leveling the Playing Field Act, which significantly strengthened U.S. trade remedy law by clarifying the injury standard for the International Trade Commission in anti-dumping and countervailing duty, or AD, CVD cases, and providing the Commerce Department with additional tools to address dumped and subsidized imports. <coughs> this was the result of forceful bipartisan leadership by steel champions in both the House and Senate. Just months later, the Enforce and Protect Act was passed. This law provided U.S. Custom with new tools and directives to aggressively enforce U.S. trade remedy orders and crack down on duty evasion and customs fraud. It was critical that the second law followed as ADCVD orders only level the playing field if they are strictly and effectively enforced. Senator Casey and Senator Wyden, thank you for your roles in enacting these stronger trade tools. U.S. Steel and other domestic producers moved swiftly in the summer of 2015 to utilize these new laws by filing a series of new ADCVD preditions on a flood of unfairly traded imports of hot rolled, cold rolled, and corrosion resistant steel from 12 countries. As a result of these cases, and due to the new laws, 28 new ADCVD orders were obtained on 11 countries, providing U.S. Steel Corporation and American producers with critical relief. Though these recent flat-rolled duty orders stem the tide of unfairly unfair traded imports from the targeted countries, an all-too-familiar story unfolded. Low-priced imports surged in from other countries. For example, Imports of cold rolled and corrosion resistant steel from Vietnam replaced imports from China nearly ton for ton. As a result, U.S. producers filed circumvention petitions with the Commerce Department in September of 2016. Last December, the department issued a preliminary affirmative finding that imports of Chinese steel finished in Vietnam should be covered by the same ADCVD orders on imports from China. This decision should put other countries and other foreign producers on notice that circumvention will no longer be tolerated. Another egregious situation is imports of oil country tubular goods, or OCTG, particularly from Korea. In 2014, we obtained ADCVD orders on Korean OCTG, and in the years since have attained higher and higher anti-dumping rates in each administrative review. However, dumped OCTG, imp <laughs> OCTG imports from Korea have continued to surge into the United States. As was noted earlier, total OCTG imports reached nearly 200% increase in 2017 over 2016. Korea has no domestic use for OCTG products. Our nation, our nation must not tolerate these trade tactics to continue. We need American-made steel products to harness our abundant natural resources so we're truly able to achieve American energy security and independence. And of particular significance at this moment is the Section 232 investigation that was discussed earlier. And, and I will simply say that um, if the Senator would like to hold a hearing every day between now and April 11th when the 90 days is up, uh, we may get a decision much, much sooner. Uh, on, uh, from U.S. Steel's perspective, we urge a strong, broad action on imports uh, that are threatening our national and economic security under Section 232. The threat posed to America's steelmaking capacity by the unrelenting and growing barrage of imports merits aggressive action by President Trump. An effective Section 232 remedy must be comprehensive and broad-based, covering all producing countries and the full range of steel products, including semi-finished products with only limited exceptions for products that are not currently available from a U.S. maker. We're encouraged by Tuesday's meeting at the White House, by the advocacy from members of Congress, as well as the President's own remarks. We are optimistic that a Section 232 action will come soon. On the hearing second topic, investment in infrastructure, this is both a necessity and an opportunity for a steelmaker. We depend on an efficient, reliable transportation system to move millions of tons of raw materials and finished product, and the long-term investment to improve infrastructure
creates direct demand for steel, fosters broad economic growth and job creation, which further drives steel demand. As the infrastru infrastructure discussion advances, we encourage a focus on three priorities. Increased long-term investment that is essential to undertaking large-scale projects, those that uh, consume steel. Uh, project streamlining is also critical. It will responsibly condense the permitting process to lower costs and deliver projects sooner. And as has been discussed, uh, the third priority is maintaining the commitment to the long-standing Buy America principle that the iron and steel that's purchased with taxpayer dollars, the iron and steel that's used to rebuild our nation's infrastructure should be produced, both melted and poured, here in the United States. That's a pr principle that must be maintained as the uh, infrastructure debate continues in the United States Congress. Senator Casey, thank you again for your leadership in convening this hearing and the opportunity to provide perspective to the Senate on priorities of a fundamental importance to U.S. Steel and our country. We stand ready to support and assist your important work. Todd, thanks very much. And th I want to thank our panel for their testimony. Now we'll go to questions. We'll just alternate between um, Senator Wyden. Um, Senator Wyden and I will, will alternate. Um, he has both seniority and rank over me, so there might be a time when he gets two questions, or I can't control that. I want you to know that up front. Um, let me start with the, uh, the, the the reality of where we've been the last year with regard to the president. It's the fact that uh, Secretary Ross uh, has this press conference, which might be underway now, or press call, and the fact that he called Senator Wyden is, and is announcing um, something today. That's fine. That's that's positive, I guess. Uh, when you have the Commerce Secretary engaged, and, and uh, as he has been, and I've spent some time talking to him, but we need to hear from the President of the United States. I can't say it more plainly than, than that. We can, all of us can talk about it, and he can make uh, reports and all that, but the central person here in terms of making this determination on 232, as well as other issues, is the President of the United States. The President has talked a lot about taking action, but so far we haven't seen it. What we need is action that will lead to concrete, positive results for both U.S. companies like U.S. Steel as well as um, United States workers. So I guess the first question I have, I'll direct it at both uh, Scott and Todd um, and anyone else who wants to weigh in. Um, can you tell us what happened uh, to imports of subsidized steel following the passage of the Level the Playing Field Act and how U.S. industries responded. Scott, do you want to start? Sure, I will briefly. Like, uh, like you, Senator, uh, Todd has seniority over me. He serves on our board, and so oh, okay. I, will <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will. I will. I will leave him to, to, to hit clean up on this. But I will just say that uh, so, some of the data y you've articulated already. You saw a <coughs> otherwise hard to explain uh, spike in steel imports, um, especially considering there had been some dumping orders in place. Um, and you can only attribute that to what I would call gaming the system, where you've raised expectations that there will be uh, limitations to market access. Uh, importers and countries respond to that by uh, surging the market with goods. Um, that relief never came. Um, and it had a, it resulted in, and, and you've heard various data points here, both uh, very high import penetration into the U.S. market, uh, 27 percent, um, in, in, a, 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 an increased overall in steel imports of at least 15 percent, and obviously in some items like OCTG up to 197 percent. Um, in, in a in an environment where there should be expansion and hiring at local mills, in some cases you've seen layoffs, as in uh, Conshohocken in, in ArcelorMittal, which makes you know military grade steel, one of the few producers that does that, and so it, it has had real and palpable consequences. And and I would uh, I would echo what, uh, what what Todd Young said is that you know we need we need a decision tomorrow uh, on this. We've had you know 200 and you know, 270-some day, days almost of, well, more than that now, uh, of, of deliberation, and uh, it's time to act. And, I, and the gap between the um, commencement of an investigation and a det final determination by the president, the reason why that 
that gap of 270 plus days is important is because in that period you had you had this import surge of players in the marketplace taking advantage of what uh, of that time gap that's why the the promptness or the urgency is critical but Todd you have something to add on this uh, uh, briefly I'd like to add as I referenced uh, uh, in the testimony soon after the enactment of the acts um, it would, could be measured in weeks and days. The industry launched these three uh, new cases on flat rule products, mm -hmm. uh, successfully pursued those uh, with the assistance of the new laws. Uh, but what we've, and, and relief was gained, uh, 2016 was much better than 2015. The challenge though is, is the, uh, what's often referred to as the whack-a-mole problem. Uh, you address unfair imports from certain countries only to now see them enter from another country. Uh, we, in 2017, as has been noted, there, the, almost every statistic shows an increase of imports over the prior year. Overall steel imports are up 15%, uh, 2017 over 2016. Uh, there's a growing problem. Uh, part of the reason why we were very optimistic about the potential of a Section 232 uh, that you're dusting off a new uh, a tool that hasn't been utilized for some time. And importantly, it grants broad authority to the president uh, to take comprehensive action uh, to address this problem. Uh, some of these problems, are, as I said, are popping up as the result of a recent case. Some of them are intractable challenges that no matter what tool industry is sought to use, it has not stopped the unfair trade. And uh, uh, that's why we're optimistic that uh, a 232 uh, decision can address some of these challenges. Uh, it instituted broadly and in across uh, products and countries and for a sufficient time for the industry to stabilize, to invest in itself, uh, to strengthen our, our base here in the United States so that we can provide for our, not only our national security but our broader economic security. Well, Todd, I, I think it's a significant what you said just now and also what you said in your testimonies. You're talking about acts of Congress level the playing field in, in the Enforce Act, which Senator Wyden played such a, a leading role in, acts passed by Congress actually having a positive impact on this issue. Um, and if we can couple those acts and the tools therein with actions by the President, we can make real progress. Just I'll make two points before I turn it over to Senator Wyden. I, I, I'm, I worry that sometimes the audience that might listen to this later might not have a, a real sense of what we're talking about when we say 232. Just so they know, Scott mentioned the uh, the 1962 legislation President Kennedy signed. Here's what, here's the the basic 232 um, focus. This review that's been undertaken by the administration uh, announced uh, all those days ago uh, makes a, m focuses on one thing: whether imports adversely affect number one U.S. national security. So whether an import from another country an unfair advantage is adversely impacting our national security, that's one, uh, and could result in trade restrictions uh, on imports. So that's what the, that's what the President's um, determination will focus on. And um, I can't think of a more urgent issue than our, our own national security as well as our, uh, our economic security. So I want to turn it over to Senator Wyden. Um, Senator, Senator Casey, I'm going to pick up right where you left uh, <coughs> off because I think now we're going to kind of try to wrap up what we think the problems are and then go to kind of the remedies. So in your view, Mr. Young, what as of today are the most significant trade violations affecting you as a U.S. manufacturer and obviously your Well, I discussed several of them in the testimony, but to, to, to sort of uh, summarize them. Uh, one, there's the fundamentally uh, unfair imports that are dumped below the cost of production in the U.S., uh, which certainly threatens our ability to compete um, uh, uh, fairly. There is also the challenge of foreign governments that are subsidizing those products uh, into the United States. Uh, often these are addressed through our anti-dumping countervailing duty portion of the law. Uh, when, when that portion of the law is successfully pursued, then we've got a question of enforcement. Is it now going to come in from another country? Is, is, is Chinese steel going to Vietnam and then coming to the United States? 
uh, we a recent decision by the Commerce Department Department seeks to address that. Uh, we also have a situation to where you know there's a question as to whether there's there's simply fraud uh, involved uh, with the payment of customs duties. Uh, we've got a host of these problems when it comes to Korean OCTG in general. So I would say there's just the fundamental unfair imports. Then there's the cheating to get around uh, when our when our laws uh, are put a duty in place to protect us. Uh, and as was referenced earlier, uh, we at U.S. Steel have also been the um, uh, have also been attacked by uh, 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 by um, uh, cyberspace attack, uh, where we were one of several Pittsburgh institutions targeted by the Chinese military uh, for our intellectual property. Uh, we've spoken about this publicly. We cooperated with the Department of Justice uh, here in Western Pennsylvania when they they succeeded in pursuing indictments against these Chinese military leaders. So we see an array of challenges. Um, like we said, the improvements in the law have helped us uh, fight back against those. Uh, the, the challenge is, is that oftentimes they breed new attacks and, and new avenues of unfair trade. The other side's not resting um, uh, in their efforts. You are so right about the other side not, not resting, and I'm going to get into that um, here in a moment with respect to one of the more imaginative ways in which they a cheat because, as you know, uh, the gentleman behind me ran a sting operation. We set up a dummy website that was designed solely to try to catch trade cheats and invite people from around the world to essentially be be in touch with uh, with the dummy web website, and we were flooded. So we're going to talk about that, I think, on my second round in terms of um, uh, merchandise uh, laundering as we came to. Uh, describe it, but I think what you said, and I want to make sure because it highlights Senator Casey's point about how valuable 232 is, is that that begins to again deal with this end run through relocations and, and the like. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, rather than tackling this on a case by case, product by product, country by country basis, the Section 232 allows a comprehensive remedy. Uh, to basically weave together solutions to each of those challenges. Senator Casey, I wanted to, to uh, focus on kind of the, the two broad uh, topics we're here to discuss today, and I've opened open this up to anyone on the panel. Um, on the one hand, we're dealing with this issue of cheating, which is significant, um, and obviously anytime you allow a cheater or a, a cheating strategy to, to uh, Remain in place, or to be uh, to go uh, to be unfettered. You're going to have a, a bad outcome for for the country that's uh, the victim of the cheating, and that happens to be the U.S. That's th so. That's cheating on cheating on trade. That's part of what we're talking about today. But also, we're when we under invest in our infrastructure, we're cheating ourselves uh, as a nation. So you've got both at work here. Both are are pernicious. One is imposed upon us by another country or several countries um, when they do dumping and, and take other actions that are adverse to our workers and our companies. Uh, but the other cheating is <laughs> is on us if we don't make the investments we should be making. So I, I wanted to open it up to the panel f on both, uh, both of those issues. And in particular, and maybe I'll direct this uh, to Scott, um, w one of the one of the the, uh, the the tools that we have is custom and border protection. <coughs> How do you feel custom and border protection is doing with regard to efforts to identify, prevent, and address duty evasion and circumvention? If you can describe what we mean by by both. Sure, and it, th this. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator Casey. I think it's a, a great one, and I'm glad that Senator Wyden mentioned the sting operation because yes. it really brought to light the type of challenges that we've seen. And this goes back to the, the, the point of my testimony, which is that trade enforcement hasn't been at the core of our strategy for a very long time. You know, customs, uh, in, uh, c customs and duty evasion um, and circumvention uh, occurs because there's opportunity uh, and because there's lack of enforcement. And 
Um, the opportunity is that we have, even though we're only 5% of the population, we have an outsized amount of consumption uh, compared to the rest of the world. And so we're an attractive target. And uh, the, our, our, our border protections with respect to uh, fairly traded goods uh, are really um, underfunded. Um, and that has had uh, serious consequences for uh, y products that range from steel and other metals to uh, consumer products. And with the, uh, you know, with digital platforms being available to sell this, I mean, it's just, it, it's expanding exponentially. Um, and it is a, uh, so it, it's something, again, that I think that most average citizens probably don't think about. Um, but it has a real and palpable impact on the ability of our country, of our companies to be competitive. And this is where we've underperformed, to your point. Our, our industries that are in global competition haven't grown as fast as the rest of our economy for a very long time. And it's not because we don't have great workers. You heard uh, uh, Rick's testimony that, you know, in terms of the efficiency of a steel worker. Mm -hmm. It's not that we don't have amazing entrepreneurs. We clearly do. Uh, but it's that our public policy uh, hasn't caught up. And some of that starts with those uh, very wonky, specific, and boring, but essential enforcement mechanisms that have been underfunded and underappreciated. Along the lines of wonky, can you uh, describe to the audience what you mean by duty evasion and what we should do to combat it? Sure, duty evasion, well, I guess there's two types. There's straight up duty evasion, which is d whatever our normal tariff schedule is. And then there's duty evasion when it comes to, say, dumping orders having been opposed or counter countervailing duty orders. And by those, I mean, those are uh, essentially extra taxes put on specific imports, specific, specific lines of products from specific countries uh, that have been found to have been dumped. And, and they, they, they sometimes range from 5% up to 200 or 300%. You know, there's, there's lot, lots of different ranges there. Uh, but there is a, a boutique market for both mislabeling uh, and shielding uh, these types of imports uh, from, uh, from enforcement. And so they, they're, they're essentially like contraband coming into our country. Right. And, and they have harmful impacts in, in different ways, obviously, than opioids or other, other sorts of, of, of harmful products. But, but they harm our economy and they harm our, 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 our workers. And it is a, I, I'm glad that the work of the, of the Finance Committee of Senator Weinstein has, has shed some light on this. We, we, we need stepped up enforcement of this. I want to open it. Rick and Petra, if you have something on this, and I, I have a specific uh, question for Petra after that. But Rick, anything on this in terms of the, the worker impact and what you're most? Yeah, uh, Senator, what, what the worker impact is, you know, I, I'm kind of the person to see the end results when a, an individual gets laid off and comes to our halls and, and goes over where, goes over things that he or she had in the last five years and it's all gone. Um, and trying to get that individual uh, back to work, getting them some relief, getting them some benefits, um, trying to get a, um, after the six months of unemployment that they, that they lose, uh, trying to get them on the TRA benefits, uh, to try to get them um, a, another another field of, of employment after education. Um, like I said, then I see the, inc inc the what happens at the communities, the impacts of what goes on. So it's 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 hardening to see these things go on and, and trying to get uh, uh, trying to get the um, foreign imports out when <coughs> our hands are tied. Sometimes we can't we can't do anything mm -hmm. about it until until the government works with us. Petra? Yeah, I think the um, impact on the supply chain is similar. When the steel industry is impacted and, um, you know, in decline, that ripple effect goes through the entire supply chain and puts on a lot of added pressure onto smaller companies uh, to continue to diversify, seek new markets, and look for other ways to keep their uh, employees because they certainly don't want to lose good employees due to, you know, the workforce challenges that I mentioned as well. So. Um, there's definitely a significant downstream impact. Well, Petra, I also want to put in a commercial there. I'm, uh, I'm admitting this up front as a commercial for your operation. <laughs> but, uh, and I'm not saying I'll it just because, <laughs> just because Governor Casey created the program in Pennsylvania back in the 90s. But why the hell, if I can say it that way, would any administration eliminate funding from the Manufacturing Extension Partnership? 
I wish someone in the administration could could come to me and show me the report that justifies eliminating that program. They don't have a report. It's some budget guy who doesn't know anything about it, doesn't care about it, uh, doesn't know Pennsylvania and a lot of other states <coughs> saying we don't need this program. So the, the only good news here is the Democrats and Republicans in both houses will oppose the elimination of MEP. And that's the good news. But we gotta, we can't assume that's gonna happen. Um, so, Petra, I want you know we're going to fight to get that, the funding for MEP in place. But this is the second year in a row now they talk, they've tried to eliminate it uh, in their budget. And um, I will wait a hundred years for an explanation and still not have it because there is no explanation, other than some green eye shade guy in Washington who doesn't know our states, certainly doesn't know my state, um, talking about eliminating it. So. That's my commercial, and I'm sticking to it. Um, Todd, I know we want to go to Senator Wyden, but anything on these issues? Uh, just briefly on uh, your question about duty evasion and the customs yep. um, and border protection. Uh, following enactment of the Enforce Act, I would credit the, uh, the agency for their outreach to the steel industry. Uh, that has continued through, to, through, actually will continue through two weeks from now where the acting commissioner himself, he's pending permanent commissioner, is meeting with the steel industry. We also had a delegation of, of um, uh, customs uh, personnel from around the country recently, uh, uh, either in 2016 or early 2017, visited our research and technology center here in Munhall, Pennsylvania to learn more about steel, how to identify products, how to distinguish between those so that they know that a product that has a rightful duty on it uh, they're collecting it. It's not trying to be, um, uh, uh, they're, they're not trying to misidentify the product to, to evade that duty. Mm -hmm. Scott, thank you, or Todd, thank you for that. Senator Wyden, we're going to be probably wrapping up in about 10 minutes. But Great. I, I just want to, before we leave this matter of kind of how we go after the trade chiefs who get busted in effect for dumping and unfair um, subsidies and customs and border patrol. I mean, this did affect the steel industry, as we have been um, talking about. One of the things that Senator Casey and I were very interested in is, in the past, the reason the government would drag its feet is there was no trigger to make enforcement mandatory. And I remember you and others told Senator Casey and I, you got to change that. You got to have strict timelines that ensure that the government actually brings down the hammer and there's got to be action. So we've appreciated you working with us and I think that was one of the, the big developments after we did the big sting operation and you all told us what was going on. I'm going to wrap up with one point. Um, I may have touched on it with Senator Casey, but uh, Oregon and Pennsylvania have another thing in common, something probably both of us would rather not be the case, be able to pass on it, and that is both of us uh, had our companies hacked by the Chinese. And I know that uh, the Chinese stole uh, intellectual property from you all, uh, Mr. Young. As you know, uh, our solar manufacturer, uh, Solar World, we don't have very many solar manufacturers left in the United States. They also had intellectual property uh, hacked, and in both cases, the Chinese were indicted for actually engaging in this kind of uh, action. So I just close, I think, Mr. Young, by having you tell us what was the implication of the Chinese hack on you all, and how, in your view, can the 301 case be used to get China to eliminate the unfair policy? Uh, as you noted, uh, uh, we were twice um, uh, the victims of cyber espionage, uh, which included the indictment uh, of members of the Chinese military. Uh, they specifically, in a, in a second uh, spear phishing attack, uh, sought to exfiltrate uh, confidential business information related to um, advanced high strength steels. Uh, these are uh, uh, we spend considerable effort, time, resources, money to develop this technology. Uh, it's the direction in which steel is moving. It's lighter, it's stronger. Uh, it's what the auto industry needs to meet uh, uh, efficiency standards, but uh, also still protect 
uh, uh, the occupants of those vehicles. Um, the, the, the full implication of it is not known. Um, we did bring a, a, a separate legal challenge uh, against Chinese producers uh, based upon this attack. Uh, one of the things we found is that the law uh, passed several decades ago wasn't as, as efficient in uh, processing a, a cyber espionage attack, uh, but thought that that was an important principle to not let that matter rest. Um, you know, the full impact of it is, is that, you know, if, if you can steal from us what we've spent years and uh, uh, extensive resources developing uh, on the next generation of steel, and you don't go through that process yourself, uh, certainly a, a, a shortcut that would help uh, potentially an entire industry uh, in China who has half of the world's steelmaking capacity. Any, anything about this relate to 301 and using it? To yeah, we we um, we actually filed comments uh, when the 301 process uh, was initiated, um, uh, noting in particular uh, part of the 301 effort is is um, targeted on the uh, sort of mandatory voluntary um, uh, uh, transmittal of of intellectual property in order to do business in China. Uh, what we wanted to make. What we wanted to have on the record, which was known, um, but to reiterate is, is that it's not just a matter of them making you uh, take a step uh, uh, to, in, to uh, engage in their markets. Uh, they, they attack us, um, and they do it through cyberspace. Um, and uh, making sh the, the question of exactly how a 301 could be used in that front, uh, you know, we're very curious to see the outcome of this report, similar to the 232. Um, we expect that it's coming, um, but uh, uh, you know, we've obviously taken steps since that time to seek to prevent a similar outcome. Um, we're not seeking to produce steel in China. Um, we are happy to produce it here as a 100% uh, American company, from, uh, from the raw materials to the final steel produced, um, uh, to the degree they have some of our, our uh, confidential business information or using it. Our priority would be to not let that product into our country. Um, Senator, maybe uh, just a quick comment. Uh, cybersecurity is a huge, huge uh, issue for small manufacturers as well. Uh, as you can imagine, they're resource constrained. They don't have the full IT staff and departments to really, uh, you know, uh, manage that. But also, um, they're targets. Small companies are targets for financial uh, fraud, for financial risk. And we suspect very soon they will be targets for um, just stealing of intellectual property, as was already mentioned, and also shutting down of production facilities. One small company can be a critical element of a supply chain. You shut that company down, that whole supply chain can be shut down. Uh, so again, it's just uh, it's a it's a major issue, not just for large companies, but for small ones as well. Thanks. It, it, which might be the last, unless Senator Wyden has one. He certainly has opportunity to ask another question. I, I wanted us to, to turn to Rick Galliano. Rick, um, we were with the President <coughs> on Tuesday, as I said, around a, a long table, and um, that, was a, that was a good discussion we had. Um, I brought up at the, uh, at the um, it wasn't by way of a question, it was just urging the President to act in a time frame shorter than the 90 days. I probably should have used the word the number 60 because it's actually only about 60 days left for him to decide. But I said that because of this lo this uh, this delay, and I know some people listening might say, "Oh, there goes a member of the United States Senate complaining about government inaction, and government's always slow. And what's what's different about this one, and what's the difference, right?" But this one has this delay has real consequences for uh, the surge of imports, and obviously. What flows from that is real adverse consequences for the workers. If you can walk through that a little bit and just give us a sense of what this means, what this delay means, this lack of a remedy means in re the real life of a real worker. Every day it, uh, it delays is every day an, em an employee may lose their job, a member may, may lose their job. As that continues um, with the foreign imports, the Industry itself slows down, and, and that and that shows that uh, the unemployment office gets busier because they lose their jobs. So, in, in fact, that if if this is stalled 
any length of time, uh, we're, we're going to have have issues dealing with it with with the last depression or recession that we had uh, five or six years ago or seven years ago with the, with the with the factories uh, being 50 percent idled as it was back then. Um, the plant that I come out of, um, it just started getting busy in the last two years. Uh, four years before that, it was it was slow and it came into a cycle that they're busy again. But with the foreign imports coming into this country as fast as they can, I fear that uh, uh, that, that same thing's going to happen going forward if this doesn't pass within the next six months or three months. Mm -hmm. And your testimony, when you talked about recent um, action to, to uh, give, give more, put more tools in the toolbox, and you said, and I'm looking at this page, the first page of your testimony, um, when you talked about the passenger vehicle light truck tires uh, issue, you talked about um, the uh, a three billion dollar investment into U U.S. tire plant expansions and factories because you had that tool available. Correct. Seven thousand two hundred union tire workers at Goodyear reached a new five-year agreement. So, in other words, you have tools. You use those tools for enforcement, and you get results from American right. workers. And with the five-year agreement, no employee will be laid off at that time yeah. for the full five years. So what we're trying to do together is to get the same results for uh, steel workers and others, just like that happened in the, the tire context. So it's a good, it's a good analogy, a good comparison. Senator Wyden, I, I think this has been very, very helpful, Senator Casey, and. You started out, whatever it was, an hour and a half ago or, or something, talking about how in life sometimes, particularly for us you know, in, in the Senate, you can be talking about something and everybody says, that's interesting. Let's come back in six months or eight months and find out what's uh, going to happen. But what you have done by scheduling this hearing, and we've, you know, we've been kidding. We went to the meeting to schedule the hearing. All of a sudden, we're going get, to get results. <laughs> but... This is not the first time you have led our committee on these issues. You have, as we've talked about with respect to the Enforce Act and leveling the playing field and, in effect, uh, keeping the pressure on day in and day out have helped us, as I've described it, begin a fresh approach on trade that I've come to call trade done right. So. I just want you to know I very much appreciate your giving me this invitation. We've learned a lot of um, valuable uh, facts here today, and I think all of you Pennsylvanians can expect to see Senator Casey and I, um, to some extent, perhaps as early as this afternoon, start commenting on some of the things that the President may want to pursue, and we'll talk about what the voices of Pennsylvania have had to say about it. Senator Wyden, thanks very much. We're grateful you're here and grateful for your leadership on these issues. I have to say that uh, <clears throat> I don't know uh, exactly what was said on the conference call that Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross had at, I guess, 1030. We'll, we'll learn that soon. But here's what I hope happened. This is a little bit of, little bit of fiction, but it, it, it lightens the mood a little bit. I'm hoping that w S Secretary Ross got on the phone before he walked through too much of his presentation, that he was there solely to be introducing another person on the phone, and the president got on the phone and made it an announcement. I don't think that happened, but I'm, I'm hoping. Because <laughs> we, we want to hear from the president on 232. We want to hear from the president that he's going to use every tool at his disposal to fight back against uh, what China cheating, to fight back against any country trying to take our jobs, and to put in place bipartisan approaches to, to create and ret retain jobs. The President, and I should have, I, I referred to this letter the other day when I had my, my uh, two minutes of, of uh, question or, or comment. I referred to a February 1st letter that the President received, uh, and this is signed by, if I count the signatures, it's about 25 uh, steel executives. I won't read all of it, obviously, but the one thing that they said in this letter, among many important points, and I reiterate this today for what I hope will be the determination by the President. They said, quote, we urge, we're talking about a 232 uh, decision, we urge you to implement a remedy that is comprehensive and broad-based, 
covering all major sources of steel imports in the full range of steel products with only limited exceptions for products not currently available in the United States. A lot of words there, but the most important are they want a remedy that's comprehensive and broad-based. The President was being was, was um, uh, advised by some members of Congress in the room to be narrow and focused and limited and balanced and all that. That always sounds nice, but when it comes to American workers, we don't want to be limited. We don't want to be balanced. We want our workers to win uh, based upon uh, based upon the actions the federal government can take in, in the Congress. We don't want to we don't want to be targeted. We want to win these races. We want to get these jobs and keep these jobs, because as was pointed out earlier, Rick, I think you made the point. I mean. When folks lose jobs in these circumstances, it's not something that that worker did or that that company did. It's because other countries are cheating and we're not holding them accountable, even though we have all the tools to do it. And we've got to make sure that that becomes the case. You know, I've said it a thousand times. I'll say it again. We had a a um, statue that was, or, or um, it's a bronze uh, sculpture, I should say, that was put in front of the governor's residence in Harrisburg. The guy that put that there, I knew pretty well. He said, and he got support from every union in the state of Pennsylvania to build that bronze sculpture of a steel worker putting in place a steel beam. He said the reason he put it there was to remind every future governor about what steel workers meant to the country, how they built our country, uh, and how they helped us outproduce the world to guess what? Win World War II. That's about all they did, right? Um, and it's about time that we take a similar approach and have a similar determined spirit to fight on their behalf when it comes to protecting their jobs. If they have a level playing field, if we enforce the law, if we hold other countries accountable, and if we bring cheaters to justice, so to speak, guess what? Steel workers or all of our workers can outcompete the world and do as they're as their uh, ancestors did to win World War II and to win any war, whether it's economic uh, or otherwise. So that's all we're asking. We're not asking for something extra here. We're just asking for people to enforce the law, use the tools that you have, and win these races, win these, these uh, fights for our workers. So I'm so grateful that our panel was here with us today to give us a perspective on this. I'm sp certainly honored to be here at the Community College of Beaver County. And Senator Wyden, we're grateful that you had took the time to travel to Pennsylvania and also even more grateful <coughs> for your work uh, on the Finance Committee on these issues. So unless there's anything further, we are adjourned. Ron, thanks. The gavel goes Appreciate down. <laughs> the gavel goes down. Hey, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.